is doing it, and everybody is getting rich. Why not? Everything is going one way, and one way only. Up, 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 and up. Production, sales, bank deposits, broker's loans, stocks, especially broker's loans and stocks. Up. They were dancing their nights away as if there were no tomorrows. At least, none worth worrying about. But there was one tomorrow that would come that would change everybody's life forever. Early Tuesday morning, October 29th, 1929, started just like any other morning. People went about their business as usual. In the United States, Wall Street opened, just as it had for the last 20 years. The trading floor was a frenzy of activity, except on this day, all the trade orders were to sell, not buy. <laughs> Not even the experts realized this sell-off would lead to the devastating crash that would plunge the whole world into what was to become known as the Great Depression. That Tuesday affected the lives of millions of people around the world. Prominent traders and businessmen jumped to their deaths from multi-story buildings. The hard-working middle class lost their life savings, businesses, homes and jobs. Dozens of millionaires became mere statistics in the fast-growing ranks of the unemployed. By the end of the year, the market lost in those days the unbelievable sum of $40 billion in equity. Two years later, at the depths of the Depression, the American national income had fallen by 50%. 5,000 banks had closed their doors. In the late 20s, there'd been no venture too risky to invest in. The prospect of acquiring prosperity by borrowing without the ability to repay had tempted the normally conservative middle class to risk all they owned before the crash. There'd been a few that warned of impending disaster from overvalued markets and accumulated debt, but their words were dismissed as just gloom and doom. This was a new era, a new age of prosperity. This was the 20s. In the late 90s, we are again living at a time when volatile stock markets are posting record highs. The speculative frenzy of recent years has driven markets to dizzy levels. The Dow Jones industrial average and local stock markets make the news every night. No fashionable new company is too risky to invest in. Mutual funds are claiming record returns. For the most part, the world economy has steadily expanded since World War II. And in many sectors, there is again today a new level of prosperity not seen for many years. The Great Depression is little more than a faint memory, a point of historical interest. Our children are taught it will never happen again. Yet as we stand on the brink of the next millennium, are we entering an age of unprecedented peace, wealth and prosperity? Or could it be that we again stand on the verge of another Great Depression? Only this time, one that would plummet the world's great industrial economies to the status of mere poverty-stricken nations. While this documentary primarily looks at examples from the United States, the fundamentals and principles explored apply to every developed economy in the world and intimately affect each one of us. The emergence of a global economy in the 80s and 90s has led to interdependence never seen before in the industrialized economies of the world. No nation today is, is uh, sufficient unto itself. The problems we have in America are no different than what you have in Australia, than what England has, and what Germany has. They're just different numbers. The world markets are so intertangled. It's almost impossible today for some small sector of the economy to have a problem of any kind without affecting all the others. To a large extent, stability in this global economy relies on the stability of the U.S. Not only Australia that depends on the U.S. economy, I think it's the whole world. What happens today in the U.S. economy 
affects the lives of millions of individuals and families around the world. The U.S. dollar right now is the functioning reserve currency of the world. International trade is uh, a vital part of the economy of any nation of the world. We are an enormous economy. We're a seven trillion dollar economy. Oil is priced in dollars and the national banking use dollars as a reserve currency. All of our gold prices are measured on the U.S. dollar. If you took two-thirds of all the other nations, they still wouldn't equal our economy. Its impact on the credit markets, its impact on the equity markets, its impact on suppliers. We are far more global, far more intertangled than ever before, which um, is, is, is not, by the way, stabilizing. As well as this increased economic interdependence, the last half of this century has seen Western democracies undergo dramatic changes, many of them deeply changing the fabric of society itself. If you studied about America 30 years ago in school, that America does not exist today. That was an America worth dying for. That was an America that had still a vestige of its heritage, its traditions. The military doesn't exist. The morals, the integrity, the accountability, the responsibility for your behavior does not exist today. I think the 60s really began to change, a moral change in America, the moral climate of America changed. It's absolutely unreal what is occurring in America. Good morals is good economics. Today there are no restraints anymore. While many believe social, moral and economic issues are closely linked, economists and analysts from all sectors are increasingly concerned about what they see as the key destabilizing fundamentals that are built into our industrialized economies today. The standard of living needs to double every generation. Now it's more than 75 years that it will take for our children and grandchildren, meaning they'll never really get to the point that we've gotten to. Taking that whole middle level of management, there were, there were very good paying jobs, and we eliminated it. They're out there doing service work for a half to maybe sometimes a third of what they used to get paid for. We have millions of Americans in their late 40s and 50s now trying to find jobs who were never trained in the current economy. A hundred years ago, we are the highest income earners in the world. And now, of course, we're barely in the top half of industrial nations per capita income. Government statistics and reports coming out saying that the, that the economy is strong and so on and so forth. Um, our economy is really not that strong. Government is too big and it's out of hand and nobody can get a handle on it. But that's translated into taxes are too high, spending is too high, and the deficit is too high. The deficit of the federal government, which is unconscionable, that elected representatives of the people's government in America would consciously take a nation down the road to bankruptcy, which is what the Congress of the United States is doing today. And the bank says that you can have your money that you've deposited into this account. You can have it back anytime you want. That's a contract. They cannot honor that contract for all of their depositors because most of that money that is put into deposit, they immediately turn around and they loan to someone. The system is inherently fragile because it's inherently bankrupt. You stop and think about how easy it is to run a bank today. Not only do banks not have any money. Nobody wants their money out of a bank as long as they think the bank has it. But if they're sure the bank doesn't have it, that's when they want it. You could have a number of scenarios. You could have hyperinflation as happened in Latin America. You need to protect yourself against inflation more than anything else. We have not solved the inflation problem. When it sparks back up, it'll spark really large. You'd have to take wheelbarrow loads of these things down just to buy a loaf of bread. So this is called hyperinflation. The, the bugaboo is deflation. It's the one thing you don't read about. Once it starts to bite because all that debt just keeps collapsing on itself, one debtor can't pay, and that means another debtor can't pay, and it just collapses down, implodes. Even real estate deflates. And stocks, of course, just get removed. The implosion of value is inevitable. Sooner or later, there's got to be a correction. And when that happens, it's going to be very disturbing uh, to most investors, not just in the United States, but also in the world. It's a record period of nearly nonstop advance. And in the process, it has gotten prices to the most overvalued level in the history of the United States. There is no example, including the 1929 high and the 1835 high, 
uh, of any time when stocks were more expensive than they are today. And that tells us that uh, there's more risk than there ever has been before. There's a correction coming in the U.S. stock market. Every few generations, uh, the markets go crazy, and everybody thinks the shortcut to riches is to buy stocks or speculate in real estate. That's what's happening in our stock market. But that does not reflect the true value of that stock market. Ultimately, uh, those dreams are dashed. Uh, particularly when the public en masse believes them to be true. Everybody realizes if you keep doing what we're doing, you're going to die. You're going to kill this economy. It can't work the way it's working. The thing is not sustainable. They're living on a lot of delusions. Do these key fundamentals compounding together make our economy more fragile than any other time in the history of the West? Clearly, our economy today is very different to what it was before the last Great Depression. You must remember that our money was still backed partially by gold. So when people had money, they had something of value. The productive base of the country was still intact. 60 years post gold, 60 years post silver standard, you know, those things don't circulate anymore. We've had two generations of people who've grown up who don't understand anything about gold and silver. It's interesting that it wasn't that long ago that America was the world's largest creditor. And today it is not only a debtor, it is the world's largest debtor. We're living on our borrowing power. We're changing from a, an industrialized nation, from a manufacturing nation, to a service nation. Labor is so cheap in these third world countries, that just simply destroys our manufacturing base, and, but also our wage base. We're trying to adjust now to a new environment where we're going to service people as opposed to sell them uh, products, and that's very difficult. Today, one can argue that most of the institutions that we look to for a sense of security are fragile or corrupt. But when you study history, you get so many important uh, clues. You can compare a current situation to something you've seen before. On the eve of the 21st century, as we look to the future, how important are the lessons of history? Do the great civilizations before us hold any relevance to us today? History teaches us that you can't continue down a road indefinitely of just violating what some people call the rule of the whole. All of this has happened before, routinely throughout history. People think it can't happen again, but it always happens in cycles. And the rule of the whole is simple. It says when you're in one, don't dig deeper. A crash is inevitable in Australia. The big question is, is when and how it's going to evolve. There'd be panic. Uh, people would start hoarding what money, money they had, and so commerce would unnecessarily contract because of the psychological factor. I don't see how we can avoid a financial collapse at the rate we're going. We're kind of like the, the drunk that's been on a binge for a long time. Uh, we're going to pay. There's going to be a hangover of some kind. We have residual pockets of unemployment. Uh, the uh, standard of living is going down for many Americans. Debt is very high. Bankruptcies are skyrocketing. We have a huge uh, international debt that, that we're dealing with. Herb Stein was famous for being a chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors in the early 1970s. And he likes to say that in the long run, unsustainable trends do not continue, which is kind of a tautology, but it does suggest that market forces do come into play sooner or later. I don't see any way that it will stop short of running straight into the wall. At this rate, there will finally be a panic and there'll be a dumping of dollars, which means a lot of inflation in this country. And it goes back to dishonest weights and measures that's in our system now, and that's why the system cannot survive much longer, and it will ultimately fail. The 1997 economic report of the president claimed the American economy is the healthiest it has been in three decades. In Australia, we are told a deregulated economy offers a bright future well into the next century. Yet these claims are amid concerns that time is running out to fix the chronic problems that face our economies. And while left to compound, the possibilities of a devastating collapse of the world economy increasingly becomes a reality. Does this generation and that of our children face economic hardship not experienced by developed nations for many generations? As they create this money, they get so much debt out there uh, 17 trillion dollars of debt. 
but they only have roughly five trillion, more or less, of money supply. The time will come uh, in America, in the world, where we will all learn how big the debt bubble can get before it blows up in our face. Jefferson said, we are morally bound to pay our debts ourselves. He was very concerned about creating debt. The debt is bad because it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and we're passing it off to some future generation to pay off. He was concerned that the minute we started going into debt, we would never get out. And unfortunately, he's been proving right. And we have all of this debt chasing debt around the world. It's just one great big debt trail. Debt produces interest payments. So they have to continue making more money so that, they, so that people can pay the usury on top of it. Banks who make their living by collecting interest payments on debt, therefore, they do not want debt paid off. They want bigger and bigger and bigger debt. Debt binds people and destroys initiative. The governments are in the most debt. Uh, there's corporate debt where corporations will borrow money by issuing bonds. Most Americans are in debt. Uh, quite a few are so heavily in debt. Banks in America are being very frivolous with their money. They're lending it to people who should never be able to borrow. The rise in debt worldwide in the last 20 years has been quite alarming. Debt is destructive in an economy because as it grows, it compounds, and many fear ultimately becomes unserviceable. When you buy things on credit, you don't avoid the decision that you couldn't afford them. You only delay that decision. The government is running debts on a regular basis. Uh, uh, the deficits are huge. Every day, we're adding probably better than a, a billion dollars to the national debt. And this thing is going on and on, and it's creating a huge debt bubble. There are more and more treasury securities out there. 50 years ago, people did not borrow money. They didn't, and they were proud of the fact, and a person who did borrow money to operate on was suspect. There are some companies who, I mean, were debt-free, had billions of dollars in reserves, and so on and so forth, and took on debt. Today, everyone finances through a bank. Everyone has a line of credit, and if he can't, he can't do business. See, it's not just government debt. It's private debt we're talking about. The average young couple calling us will make about 30,000 American dollars per year but they will owe in school debts about thirty to forty thousand dollars. One of the most egregious forms of debt in my mind is credit card debt. In addition to that, we'll have ten to fifteen thousand dollars in credit card bills. And so they extend to us that credit and we go out and we'll borrow that money when we buy things on our credit card. It's estimated for every ten thousand dollars of credit card debt that people have, it will take them approximately ten years to pay it off. There's no way they can pay their bills. One of the greatest evidences of the growth in debt is the steady annual growth in bankruptcies. We had 1.2 million Americans file for personal bankruptcy, and that number is, a, is growing by about 25 to 30 percent every year. If an individual spends too much and borrows too much and lives beyond its means, eventually the banker calls and they have to live beneath their means, pay off the debt, or go bankrupt and go back to work. We're going to have millions and millions of American families filing for bankruptcy to try to get out from under their debts. I think a country is not totally unlike an individual. Take the municipal debt, the corporate debt, the consumer debt. Now you take the five major elements of debt in the neighborhood of $19 trillion, and you take against that all the assets in the United States, all the real estate at current prices, all the securities on all the markets, and put it all together, you don't end up with as much of the debt. So the point is we're bankrupt, technically, and so we survive by borrowing. Eventually, though, the whole country will have to suffer. They will have to eventually live within their means. We can't continue to borrow like we are, not only domestically, but internationally. And that's what this country is doing. It's borrowing on the future. Today's society is a society which is uh, committed to immediate gratification. People are willing to loan us money, and we're living high on the hog. It's a society that has grown up to live on debt. One of the most dramatic examples of the social change of the last 30 years has been the way people have increasingly turned to borrowing as a means to pay for their lifestyle. They'll borrow money to buy cars, houses, goods and services, so on and so forth. We presently support our lifestyle 
by our ability to borrow from Asia and Europe. We're buying things that in large part are indulgences. People who are market products typically spend a lot of attention trying to figure out how they can get people to commit to the products uh, on a future financing basis. Temptation is very high uh, to continue living above and beyond one's own means. Many Americans live an extremely um, lavish lifestyle. But what you find out is that when you, when you have it, you really could do without it. Uh, motor homes, uh, big automobiles, boats, airplanes in America, there's no limit to our spending. As long as it goes up, buy on margin. Brokers loans are available. All you have to do is have five cents for a telephone call, and you can even get that on credit. Borrowing on their credit cards to speculate in the stock market, sometimes a half a dozen or a dozen at a time. Uh, they have taken out home mortgages and extended them, even second mortgages, in order to speculate in the market. I think it's because so many people's dreams and hopes are tied up in rising prices right now. And uh, hope is one of the four-letter words on Wall Street. But they don't have enough money to meet their obligations on all of the money they've borrowed to finance their lifestyle. People growing up and uh, starting work now will pay more than $180,000 during their lifetime just to pay the interest on the national debt. The interest payments on the debt in this country are very, very big. It has a long-term cost on future generations of Americans. In the midst of this unparalleled borrowing, the question is asked, where do we, who are living today, get the moral authority to spend and transfer to an unborn generation the duty of paying for what we are consuming now? We're talking about a transfer of debt to another generation that if you ask them do they want it they'd say no it's putting a burden on an unborn generation the duty of what we're consuming today what's the difference you're not hitting your kid physically but you're hitting them fiscally you're taking money away taking it out of their pockets leaving our children and our grandchildren a legacy of debt it's impossible the average american born the ch a child born in america today is born with a debt of $45,000. You wouldn't go to your kid and say, well, give me all your money, I'm wasting it on government spending. Many view the consumer culture of the 70s, 80s, and 90s as a culture where people have learned that if they can't wait to get some material thing they want, they can simply go into debt to get it. Individuals have done it, and our governments have done it. It all starts with Congress. They spend more money than they take in in taxes. They spend 1.8 trillion every single year that we're around. I think the whole uh, engine that's generating this bubble is the federal government and its deficit spending program. They either have to raise taxes, which would not be politically popular, or they resort to this mechanism of borrowing the money. It is causing an increase in you know, IOUs, an increase in, uh, in uh, debt, so they need not only more money for their spending programs, but more money to pay off the old bonds. And so they have to issue new bonds to cover the old bonds, more bonds, more bonds, and more bonds. And this thing just keeps escalating. What is our government up to? To me, we're doing too much. I mean, government has uh, entered into areas where it's never been involved in before. I mean, we're trying to finance a welfare state. The regulations now dealing with uh, with wetlands protection, with the environmental protection. We're trying to police the world, and we're out of money. Restrict or regulate commerce through the internet. Um, it's, it's an ever-increasing beast, if you like, government. There's a lot of things in which the government of the United States is involved today where there's absolutely no constitutional authority for it. Our Constitution talks about a limited government, and that all powers not in the federal government would be reserved to the states. They've just usurped the power. What this country used to be all about, and that is limiting government to the protection of liberty. Government has an optimum size. It's intrusiveness of government, and it's out of hand. It's totally out of hand. It provides police, the civil justice system, the courts, and up to a point, all of that helps the economy grow. When a government gets too big and takes up too much of a domestic economy, the economy slows. The private sector becomes highly regulated, and the benefits the government is providing tail off and decline. As with anything else, there's diminishing marginal returns. We are. Every day, we're adding probably better than a billion dollars 
to the national debt in this country. And uh, that's expanding, you know, exponentially and will continue. You know, 5.3 trillion, which of course is the official debt. That doesn't include what some people view as, say, 17 to 19 trillion dollars. The frightening aspect of the debt of Western nations is their runaway government debts. Throughout history, governments have spent more than they raise in taxes. The difference between what a government spends and what it takes in revenue is called the deficit. Since the mid-60s, most Western governments have been operating deficits. The accumulation of all the deficits of a country is commonly called the national debt, while others refer to the total debt which includes corporate and personal debt. Our economy is debt-based, and the government and, and all kinds of entities, corporations and individuals, have uh, a total, a conservative total, of $20 trillion of debt outstanding. Congress is incapable of even servicing the debt. As the national debt increases each year, governments find themselves paying more and more in interest on the debt, money which is paid out for which no government benefits or services are provided. Right now, the United States has a $1.6 trillion budget for the year. That is the federal government budget. Of that $1.6 trillion, or $1,600 billion, $360 billion will go for service on the debt next year. The interest payments on the debt in this country are very, very big, $300, $400 billion annually just on interest on the debt. Over time, that is going to continue growing. In 1995, uh, it, it, was, it was taking almost 100% of the income tax revenue just to pay the minimum interest payment on the debt. Well over $300 billion, it's more than we spend on national defense. About $100 billion a year more for debt than defense. In the United States, interest is the largest item in the national budget. And many experts predict that if current trends continue, in a few short years, interest payments alone will absorb all government revenue, and the national debt will become unserviceable. At this point, no money would be left to run the country. There's compounding interest, and every year the, the federal debt keeps climbing and climbing and climbing. We pay more on our national debt than we do for all U.S. government programs in transportation, in housing, in education, in agriculture, and in literally every other thing the government does. The government debt is so substantial that we don't have the cash flow to pay the interest. We do that by borrowing. Don't confuse the debt with the deficit. If we balance the books, that is the year-to-year the, the, the -year books, we still don't make it because our existing debt is too large. $100 billion, $200 billion, $300 billion deficit. Last year our president said the deficit was $107 billion. What did the national debt increase by? It increased by $261 billion. If I ask you how much is a trillion dollars, we don't have any grasp of that. We, don't, we know what a dollar is, but let's talk about a second, like 60 seconds to a minute. How much is a million seconds? If you do that on paper, it's about 11 and a half days. How much is a billion seconds? 32 years. How much is a trillion seconds? 32 thousand years. In other words, a trillion is to a million what 32,000 years is to 11 days. You get the feeling that there's an order of magnitude change. How many seconds would equal our current report? I'm just talking about the reported, not the hidden, the reported federal debt. 160,000 years. For many years, governments have been using creative accounting and incorrect and misleading reporting to get around laws and give the appearance that things are better than they really are. There's fraudulent bookkeeping in our government uh, structure. Can't imagine anyone running a business like that. That's part of the thing that masks the real realities. Those realities will come home sooner or later, nevertheless. The lack of adequate and really accurate information inside the federal government. They have terrible input of information. They will claim that the deficit in 1996 was $170 billion. In reality, it was $252 billion. 
it appears they're smaller than they really are because they are reporting cash basis deficits rather than accrual basis deficits. The gross interest expense in that year was $370 billion, and the figure you see in the national press is $259. Right now, the federal government's probably running $500, $600 billion a year in debt when they're only reporting a couple hundred billion or less. In the figures that the national press reports as taken from the Congressional Budget Office and the Office of Management of Budget of the federal government, they don't count the interest paid by the federal government to the bonds held by government trust funds. One loophole the President and Congress uses to get around a law is to shift projects off budget. Many entitlement and spending programs are off balance sheet. The post office, the Persian Gulf War, there's a list of major things that are not in the budget. And do things by just getting it off the budget and not counting it. The way that unemployment figures are concocted in this country, people who have given up looking for jobs are no longer kept in the statistics. Another technique used by Congress is to regularly apply for temporary budget extensions, originally designed only to be used in emergency cases. Sort of like saying, you know, the businessman came up short, he wasn't running his business very well, so he goes into the pension fund and takes the money out. He says, oh, look, we did pretty well this year. Congress regularly employs what is called internal transfers of government assets, which means the government takes the money out of the Social Security Trust Fund and spends it in the general budget, allowing themselves to reduce the annual deficit numbers presented to the public. So that's really cooking the books and make things look a lot better than they really are. There's appropriations and there's deferrals, there's switches, there's uh, uh, supplemental appropriations. The figures that are being put out to the American public today are blatant fabrications and they are lies. If you did that in American business, you'd go to prison. That's called fraud. We process those people civilly and we may put some of them in jail. Most serious executives don't watch the government figures. 1992, they passed over 2,500 laws entailing more than 67,700 pages of new rules and regulations. It's a extraction of, uh, from owned property by a gun and a badge. It's a form of plunder. The American citizen is behind the eight ball every time he wakes up. He doesn't know how he's going to get hit or from where. The fact that it's collectivized so socially uh, doesn't uh, uh, change the fact that it's theft. History shows growth in government inevitably leads to growth in taxation, accompanied by increased and burdensome regulation. Assuming that you have the most competent counsel known to man, there's no way for that counsel to be informed upon what Congress has just done. I believe in a, a state of freedom where individuals take care of themselves and, and we own our own property and the government doesn't regulate everything that we do personally or economically. If you look at the bill, that they passed, or the new law that they passed, and not just at the big print. You look at what it really does, it's nebulous. There's no benefit. 80, 90 percent of what we do ignores the principle of the doctrine of enumerated powers. We're grossly overregulated. I mean, we're grossly overregulated. Our Constitution is very precise. If it's not there, if the authority has not been given to the federal government, we ought not to do it. But day in and day out, we're passing legislation that does things that we shouldn't be doing. Oversized governments require larger and larger bureaucracies to maintain their departments and programs. Loss of fiscal accountability accompanies ever-increasing amounts of waste in government spending. Some really outrageous examples of agricultural subsidy spending. Research grants that benefit only a particular industry. Millionaires basically get uh, up to $100,000 a year in subsidies to grow the sugar they wouldn't grow anyway. A lot of defense money that shouldn't be spent that's not going to really our true national defense needs. There are a lot of old agricultural subsidies which are not justifiable by any means. The Congressional Pig Book looks at all of the appropriations bills, 13 of them, and they have this year $14.5 billion in waste. Not enough is being done to balance the budget. If the Congress of the United States had the guts to limit the growth of spending over the preceding year to no more than 3% for just three years, we would be a long ways down the road of balancing our budget without raising anybody's taxes. Often our governments talk about reducing their deficits, but the disturbing reality is that they do little.
much of this talk becomes nothing more than the opportunity to continue to borrow money and increase spending and the debt. In the late 80s, for example, uh, the increase in spending back to back was six, seven, eight percent a year. And with your increase in revenue to the government com coming in at four or five percent a year, and the spending going up three or four percentage points higher. If we have a one trillion dollar uh, budget instead of a two trillion dollar budget, and we are unbalanced, we'd be better off. So it's the level of spending that we have to look at. If we balance our budget, we don't make it. Most people don't realize that because our existing debt is too large. Instead of directing it at the spending side, they, uh, we here in the Congress generally direct it toward a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Many get the impression from election campaigns and the news bulletins that their country's budget deficits are being dealt with. But in reality, there is not enough being done to address the real issues. The Grand Rugman Act of 1985 made it law in the U.S. for government to balance its budget by 1991, yet spending had soared to new heights by that year. In recent years, there's been much talk about a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Will this amendment force the government to live within their means and balance their budget? My point is that if 51 percent of both houses are willing to to vote to put into the Constitution to balance the budget in the future, they ought to have the guts to do it today. They want to balance the budget, but they really want somebody else's budget to be balanced, not theirs. If we were serious about balancing the budget, we'd do it uh, right away. They might find ways to get around it. They're very creative in terms of how they do that. The language in the balanced budget amendment is very, very loose. One, you could raise taxes to balance budget. That would be very bad. The other is, if you have a recession or if you have a war, you just ignore the whole thing. And on these off-budget items will be another way they can get around it. So they're really not addressing the real problem, which is too much spending. We have to balance our budget. And the budget is $2 trillion, and we raise taxes by $300 billion. It'll be devastating to the economy. A popularly shared fear is that governments will never reduce spending. And in an effort to reduce deficits, will resort to increased taxation. Already, Western nations are bearing a huge tax burden not dreamed of just 50 short years ago. The ancient serfs in medieval Europe worked uh, about 25% of the year for their masters, the rest reserves. Uh, in our country, you work over 60%. The tax law has changed 31 times in the last 41 years. American taxpayers pay more in direct income taxes and payroll taxes than they pay for food, clothing, and shelter combined. And that means we work half the time for the government, and we don't get very much for it, as far as I'm concerned. Add in everything else, the Social Security tax, the sales taxes, the state and local taxes, the gas tax. From January 1st until what time of the year do you work every day for the government? And we found, amazingly, that from January 1st until July 3rd in 1996, last year, the average American family worked for the government. It was only on July 4th till December 31st they worked for themselves. And it's always been our position here that when you get your tax form, you should also get an audited financial statement. Between 19, 1986 and 1996, we've had six comprehensive income tax acts. We've had over five technical corrections acts. We've had in excess of 70 major or minor other amendments or corrections to the code. By eliminating withholding of your income taxes and having people write a check each week or each month when they get paid, they would see the amount of money that's really being taken out of their pockets and going to the federal government. But because taxation is such a horrendous part of our life, taxation has to be figured into the bottom line and to the proper performance of that business plan. But if they're changing the rules on you every day, then you can do a business plan and one year later it's obsolete. We consider the impact of a direct federal regulation to be a tax because it's basically telling you that you've got to take this dollar and spend it some other way. So the bottom line is it's going to get much, much worse because government's out of control. The total cost of federal regulation and the total cost of government taxes is about half the U.S. economy altogether. So that is a very great burden. The burden has been placed on the middle class in the last 20 years as the government has expanded and taken more and more of their income. They have totally abused the power that they have been given. And they're sucking off the taxpayer. The dramatic growth in taxation in Australia in recent years has seen taxes grow to the point where in 1996, 
they were estimated to consume over 50% of the domestic economy. The Grace Commission was uh, appointed by President Reagan to examine the operations of the federal government. A serious attempt to get at um, fiscal responsibility in government. In 1984, President Reagan appointed the Foundation for the President's Private Sector Survey on Cost Control, which became widely known as the Grace Commission. He told Peter Grace, who headed up the Grace Commission, that they should all work like tireless bloodhounds to uncover the waste and mismanagement in the federal government. The amount of effort put in that was incredible. President Reagan believed that the government should be operated more like a business. It was set up to study how can you cut back government? What would it take to really trim the spending in government? It was funded solely with private contributions, $76 million. General Motors and IBM, Coca-Cola, all their CEOs were involved. With the best minds in the country, 160 corporate executives, CEOs, leaders, titans of industry and business. The Grace Commission went all over Washington, 2,000 volunteers in addition to these corporate executives. It generated a number of recommendations. 2,478 recommendations that would have saved $424 billion over three years. Along with the Grace Commission's recommendation, they found just under $500 billion worth of waste that could be trimmed out of the government on an annual basis without changing a single program by simply applying standard business practices and trimming the waste. The conclusion that they reached was you could probably trim one-third of the total spending in our government just by cutting waste out. It raised the visibility of the issue of government waste and inefficiency. 332 incompatible accounting systems and over 300 different payroll systems in the federal government. You know, just things that are ridiculous. Uh, massive amounts of fraud, massive amounts of waste. When you're talking about spending 1.8 trillion dollars per year. So a lot of the recommendations were fundamental management changes. They tried not to deal with a lot of policy issues as well as observing that in many ways the government was out of control, the Commission reached the disturbing conclusion that if left unchecked, U.S. government trends would have dramatic repercussions in the future. Deficit and the debt would simply overwhelm the country starting by the year 2000. We didn't stop the trend in the direction the government was going in, but sometime after the year 2000, the government could no longer pay its bills. They also pointed out how entitlements would have a devastating impact in the future unless they were brought under control. Tragically, many people treated its recommendations and conclusions as alarmist and didn't take it seriously. For the most part, the Grace Commission was ignored. It has failed to really uh, capture the imagination of the, of the American people. It meant that some people had to stop spending the money that they were spending on themselves or their constituents. Its basic premises and its basic forecasts uh, are valid in the sense that we are facing bankruptcy uh, somewhere along the way. The Great Depression of the 1930s was to dramatically affect the lives of many millions of families in the world. In America, the degree of pain and suffering prompted President Franklin Roosevelt to take action, which would have once been considered illegal. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. The United States has built a welfare state ever since the last depression, when there was not one in place. It began uh, with the New Deal in 1932, with the election of uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt. Which was no New Deal at all. It was a very old deal, but it was uh, polished up and had a new name to it. President Roosevelt's New Deal, for the first time in US history, saw the government provide entitlements. Ultimately, this was to lead to government domination in business, banking, commerce, and the economy, as it set out to establish what is known today as the welfare state. It accelerated unbelievably in the great society with Johnson. In 1963, after President Kennedy was assassinated, President Lyndon Johnson declared war on poverty and started borrowing money at record rates to achieve these goals. People of America were told by Lyndon Johnson, the Democrat-controlled Congress that we are a rich nation and we will not abide poverty among our folk. And that's, that's, a, you know, that's a noble statement of policy objective to abolish poverty. We declared war on it. And the reality is, some 32 years later, the war is, is, is still going on. We want to make sure that the underprivileged are taken care of. 
So we put this massive bureaucracy in place to make sure that 50% of the nation's money is transferred to someone else. The welfare state of recent years has seen social spending skyrocket. Many maintain that this social spending, while intending to solve poverty, has instead had a pronounced negative effect on the productive base of our economies. In the 30s, uh, you had, a, you had a, a folk who were filled with integrity. The heritage of this country involved the responsibility of the individual. It was a society that took for granted you get rewarded for achievement. They do whatever needed to be done to survive. Men and women forgotten look to us here for guidance. Perhaps the strongest sign of our times is that people have been conditioned by the government to look to the government as the answer to all of their problems. You didn't have five generations of people on welfare team who'd been taught to expect somebody to hand out, out you know, a handout. The average young person today grows up with the assumption that the government will take care of his medical, his education, or whatever. It's this mentality where people will be looked after by the government. They've lost the work ethic. They've lost a sense of responsibility for themselves. They think that surely everything that goes wrong in my life is someone else's fault. And the reality is, some 32 years later, the war is, is still going on and poverty is won. We've lost that war. And notwithstanding trillions of dollars that we spent, we still have about the same percentage of poverty in America that we had in 1965. The liberal left has has built a society that takes for granted that somehow the government is to take care of all this without really asking the question, who pays the government? When you pay people not to achieve, then more people get in line not to achieve. Whatever government subsidizes, you get more of, and what you tax, you get less of it. And we've subsidized poverty big time, and so we find we've got a lot of poverty. In creating the welfare state, and keeping it going, it has gone into a massive debt. What's going to happen is, as soon as the economy contracts far enough, they're going to throw up their hands and say, we can't, we have no more money. We can't give it to anyone. And just at the time in history, when the needy people are going to need support, the government won't be there to help. The sentiment for the welfare state is still pretty strong. Uh, no matter what little attempt we make to cut spending, the, con the constituent for that uh, who are receiving yell and scream. As the markets go higher and the economy expands further, people tend to elect more uh, liberal and expansive politicians. Seventy percent of everything that our government spends in America is spent on the people. The government cannot control spending. Medicare, our health insurance plan, Social Security, our retirement, basic retirement plan. Irresponsible overspending today in almost all cases amounts to little more than the indiscriminate pouring of money into entitlement programs with little regard for the outcome. All the do-gooders and everything else want more social causes, so they throw money at education, they throw money at welfare. Welfare for the inner city, you know, for the poor, the people can't take care of themselves, that consumes 70% of all of our resources. None of it works, none of it ever has worked, and yet they think by throwing money at it, without having proper uh, accountability for the funds that they're doing something. Pork barrel spending is an item that gets added in outside of the regular process of spending money. Congress finds very ingenious ways to um, attach spending measures or tax measures to bills, for example, a funding bill for breast cancer research. They couldn't find a normal bill to do it because it wouldn't pass, so they attached to the defense spending bill. Could it be that every piece of spending and waste in government has a champion somewhere who sees it not as waste, but as a means to profit? The champions of government waste are a lot of the lobbyists here in Washington. There are more than 80,000 of them. Lots of them make millions and millions of dollars doing this. And believe me, they get paid to get the government to spend money. Hardly a day goes by that somebody doesn't come to your door or to your committee or coming there for the purpose of asking you to fund yet another program or increase another program. When they get to Washington, 
Then the special interests come and lobby very heavy and say, don't cut my funding. There aren't enough members of Congress with the guts to say no. While government spending of the last three decades has accelerated out of control, politicians have appeared paralyzed with inaction. Congress is on a two-year term. That's a short fuse. No sooner is he in office, he's got to start thinking about his campaign. And the politicians realize it's just like the Indians chasing you. Stop doing what they're doing. The voters are going to put you out of office. They feel intimidated once they get to Washington. If the congressman wants to be reelected, he has to support policies uh, that will support his reelection. And, and if they've been here two or three years, they're less courageous. The way to get reelected is keep the money faucets flowing. Karl Marx said something very astute a long time ago. He said, don't worry about a democracy. It is not a form of government to succeed long term, for it can only succeed until the people of a democracy discover they can vote themselves money from the treasury, then they will bankrupt it. Americans have it, English have, Australians have. You can vote in politicians who will give you things. There's never a limit to the things that we want the government to do for us. Entitlements were claimed to be the cure for the last depression. Yet ironically, the government debt and moral change these entitlements have led to are likely to cause long-range consequences more crippling and devastating to the world than the Great Depression itself. The crunch that's going to come when the government will have no more money left in this country, Australia, to be able to look after the people. Just at the time in history when the needy people are going to need support, the government won't be there to help. In the United States today, you do not have government by and of and for the people. You have government by and of and for the bureaucrats, period. Western constitutions envisaged small government and low taxation. Governments were responsible for the peaceful and orderly coexistence of its citizens. In contrast to today, governments have become large and aggressive in their taxation rules and the enforcement of those rules. I've never heard of property committing a crime, but the government, in their wonderful manner of inflicting pain upon the citizens, now say that your, your property can commit a crime, and they take it. Good luck trying to get it back. The IRS, the ATF, and, and these other rogue government agencies, they're out of control. A lot of the agencies that are out there were not necessarily envisioned in the Constitution. The IRS is a very large, very bureaucratic, very aggressive agency. The IRS has over 100,000 employees. It operates um, with an out-of-date computer system. They intrude on the American people. They take away our freedoms. Horrendous examples of, of people being fined and jailed for, for unpaid taxes, which they already paid. A government agency can walk into this office today. And people just uh, losing their businesses and livelihoods because the IRS totally stuffed up. Totally unbeknownst to me, I can be in violation of some of their rules and regulations. Power to audit is a very, very powerful tool of intimidation and they have been using that very effectively. Look at what the government's doing to you, not for you. They are now seizing your automobile and your home and everything else because they spell marijuana on your money and you've never used drugs in your life. Socialism is theft. It's another form of taxation. The radical change will come at the next major stock market bottom. It's a extraction of uh, from owned property by a gun and a badge. It's a form of plunder. Lurch toward uh extreme government control um, in the name of whatever, stopping terrorism, stopping drugs, uh, maintaining uh, domestic order. It could be all kinds of different things. Who are they going to use the law against? You and me. The reason they like crisis is because that gives them an excuse to increase their budgets, increase their bureaucracies, and also remove rights from the people. I tell you, it's happening more and more and more. Government is totally out of control. Very much out of control. Out of control. Despite the inevitable consequences of this fiscal crisis, government rarely admits there are problems. Yet economists and analysts are becoming alarmed about what they see as insurmountable financial troubles. The problem is, is that the, the federal debt keeps accumulating. There's compounding interest, and every year the, the federal debt keeps climbing and climbing and climbing. If it gets to the point where it takes 100% of the income, pay the interest on the debt, so there's nothing left to pay anything else. From covering interest on the debt and entitlements, there will be no money left in the budget 
and a deficit before we can even begin to consider defense or the other government functions. Congress is incapable of even servicing the debt at this point. Uh, we have an ever-declining tax base and an ever greater need for more money, and that's, th those are insolvable problems. We have a liquidity problem. We had a liquidity problem in Orange County, which went bankrupt. It is a bubble built on Treasury debt. And we all know that Treasuries don't repay debt. They merely roll it forward and increase it. We are facing bankruptcy uh, somewhere along the way. Flight out of the bond market is definitely going to affect the government's liquidity. When everybody wants their money back, the money is not going to be there to pay it back. This century has seen the economies of the great industrialized nations undergo massive changes. The great speculative and boom era of the 20s gave way to a depression the world was simply not ready for. As the West recovered from the devastating depression of the 30s, their economies steadily expanded. The last half of this century has seen a transformation to a fast-changing, highly dynamic global economy. Still dominated by the United States, this globalization of economies has made every country, every market, every industry and every individual more interdependent and reliant than ever before. In the late 1990s, there are frailties built into our economies that threaten the stability of this global economy. Governments, corporations and the majority of people have taken on massive debts in recent years. We are again living in an age when leverage speculation has crept back into equity markets. The growth in the welfare state has seen a shift from people looking after themselves to a heavy reliance on government to supply all of one's needs. The growth in government, cost of large spending programs and interest on government debts has led to burdensome regulation and levels of taxation not even dreamt of 50 short years ago. Increasingly, people uncertain about their future are looking forward into the next millennium and questioning. Will it be an age of prosperity? What sort of economy will our children grow up in? And what of their safety and security? Yet many would see that the key to understanding and prospering from the future is to examine and learn the lessons from the past. If increased spending uh, could uh, uh, save an economy, Rome would still be ruling the world. We seek a new economic order aimed at the creation of a dynamic world economy in which the peoples of the world will be able to realize their potentialities in peace and enjoy increasingly the fruits of material progress on an earth infinitely blessed with natural riches. Over 50 years since President Roosevelt's opening speech at the Bretton Woods Conference, we living today in the nations referred to as blessed with natural resources, have failed to achieve the fruits of material progress referred to. Rather, we face ever-mounting debts, bankruptcies, and chronic unemployment. Rising costs, two parents working, and increasing business failures are so commonplace that they are simply taken for granted. In part one, we looked at the alarming rise in debt in the last 50 years, and the dangers associated with that debt. Yet the simple question remains, how can nations so rich in natural resources with such highly developed and sophisticated infrastructures and skilled, productive workforces now in the 90s be so heavily in debt? In the next hour, we attempt to answer this fundamental question. Is there a key to the fiscal problems of our nations? What binds us to crippling debt and restricts our ability to profit from our labor and create wealth? Could it be the money we use every day? Is that the key?
the constitutions of Western nations envisaged wealth-based economies where man's labor was rewarded with an increase in wealth. Wealth and money are ultimately uh, two different entities. You and I can create wealth. We create wealth through our labor. Men take labor and tools and they apply it to natural resources. Your labor at law is called your property. And as a result of your labor, you produce wealth. And so you can raise your cattle, you can raise your crops. That wheat crop is wealth that's being created out of the earth. One can mine uh, for the precious metals. It's dangerous work, it's very hard, plus the precious metals are rare. In a wealth-based economy, men that create wealth or property are able to trade them in the marketplace. In order to trade their property or wealth throughout history, it has been necessary for men to employ a recognized medium of exchange, or money. You can uh, receive another form of property in exchange for the wealth that you just created. You can receive money, or you can barter it for other goods and services. Money is a medium of exchange. Without money, societies grind to a standstill. Farms are unable to sell their produce. Industry becomes incapable of manufacturing products, and the movement of goods and shipping cease. Workers unable to be paid wages can no longer purchase food, and governments become powerless and cease to function. As one studies the history of money in civilizations, a regular pattern seems to emerge. The only honest money that is out there, that has been throughout time, is that of the precious metals complex. Those societies which have had gold or silver as their monetary base have prospered. Silver has been the primary money of the world most of the history of the world. Emerging societies and civilizations have tended to employ an honest, wealth-based monetary system where the money is backed by the collectivized wealth of the society as a result of the labor of its citizens. While usually gold and silver as long as this system has been maintained, the civilization has prospered, flourished, and grown. They have all, independently of each other, come around to selecting gold or silver as the basis for their money. New silver is the money of everyday commerce. They've done this not on the basis of theory, but because of trial and error. Gold is a standard that all the countries of the world recognize. Western nations were no exception where people put gold and silver, money, into circulation. People produced gold and silver, a raw resource from the earth through their labor. The United States Coinage Act of 1792 allowed people to take their gold and silver to the US Mint and have it monetized or coined for free. This they would then spend into circulation with no debt attached to the benefit and prosperity of all society. You can carry around these big, clunky, heavy, inconvenient coins in your pocket, but hey, take a look at what we have here. We've got these things called certificates. Gold and silver coins are not always as convenient to carry around as paper certificates or notes. These US silver certificates were a promise to pay the bearer one silver dollar on demand. This Commonwealth of Australia one pound note promised to pay the bearer one pound in gold coin on demand. A note is a, a specific promise to pay uh, the bearer uh, by the issuer. It's a promise to pay money. As long as these monetary system rules were followed, these economies would have an honest, wealth-based money system with little or no debt, no excessive profits or purchasing power, and no rising prices. Politicians and bankers hate gold or silver behind the money because they cannot create it out of nothing. It is an immoral act of government to debase its currency. Governments have never lived within their means. They have always spent more than they take in on taxes. It's an invisible tax. It's theft. Throughout history, as societies have grown and their governments and rulers have become larger and greedier, they have, without exception, always removed value from their currency. The rulers of the countries began to devalue the gold coins by melting them down and mixing them with, with base metals. They would put in a dross metal that, that, that made up what they took out of, of pure silver. That coin would not buy the same amount of goods and services as it did before they put the dross metal in it. We call that today inflation. 
This removal of the link between wealth and the monetary unit always has led to disastrous results in those economies, setting into motion a chain of events that ultimately destroys their societies. Once you get to the, to the era where you could print paper without having to deal with coins, then the, uh, uh, the evil began to grow in proportion. Money today is not real money, whether it's computer money or plastic money or checks or printed bills, as long as they're not backed by something tangible, such as gold or silver, then those units can be created out of nothing. This century, the monetary system of every industrial nation on Earth has systematically been transferred from wealth-based gold standards to debt-based fiat currencies. Simply put, this means that every dollar in circulation in our global economy today has been lent into existence by a bank. Every dollar circulating is someone else's debt. The primary way of monetizing this debt is through what is known as fractional reserve banking. You can actually date the history of this back to uh, the early 17th century in England. The bankers were at that particular point in time called goldsmiths. He would melt down uh, the, uh, uh, the ore, he would purify it, and then he would press it into a coin. People would then bring their coins to deposit with him, and in effect, he became the community banker. He would give them a deposit slip saying that, that it was a receipt for that amount of gold. People were purchasing their goods and their services with his bearer notes. And that was fine as long as there was as much gold or silver on deposit in the goldsmith's vaults as there were notes out there circulating in circulation. He uh, began to reason to himself, you know, there's never a day where the entire community has come and cleaned out my vault. Maybe what I can do is issue more notes, and I'll issue the notes to myself, and then I'll spend them into circulation. Each one of those notes decreased in value. The more of something you have in circulation, the less its value is going to be. This is a blatant theft and a blatant fraud. Individuals said, we don't want to trade with these notes anymore. We want our gold he didn't have the gold to back it up. This was the birth of fractional reserve banking. In a 100% reserve back bank, every deposit is backed 100% by cash, gold and silver, and securities. This system protects depositors' funds, making them depression-proof and available at all times. In contrast, fractional reserve banking enables the banking system to create vast amounts of new money, backed with nothing, through a process of credits and debits or ledger book entries. Banks, like any corporation, have assets and liabilities. The assets of banks are cash and reserves, securities and loans. Primarily, their liabilities are made up of the deposits of their clients. If $100,000 is deposited in the bank, it is credited to deposits, or in other words, it becomes a $100,000 bank liability with a corresponding debit to cash and reserves. Banks by law today are required to only hold a fraction of the original deposit in reserve and are able to lend the balance back out. The amount the bank is required to hold in reserves is called the reserve ratio. If the reserve ratio is 10%, the bank is able to lend out $90,000 against the original $100,000 deposit. At this point, the bank debits the loan account and lends out $90,000 which in turn becomes a new deposit in the next bank of $90,000. This new $90,000 loan then becomes a credit to liabilities and a corresponding debit to cash and reserves. The bank then required to keep 10% on hand in cash and reserves will then lend back out $81,000, becoming $81,000 of new deposits in yet the next bank. This process will keep repeating until such time as the commercial banking system has been able to create one million dollars of interest-bearing new loans from the original $100,000 deposit. If the reserve ratio is lowered to 5%, the system at that point is able to create a staggering two million dollars in new loans. In the US, the 1980 Monetary Control Act enabled the banks to lower the reserve ratio to zero. They're only expected to keep in reserve just a fraction of their total obligation. Bankers are not capable of creating 
wealth whatsoever until finally they're loaning out uh, 200 percent, 500 percent. And in fact, today in our banking system, there are no reserves at all of any kind. In 1993, I worked with an, with an economist at the St. Louis Fed to find out what the total reserve ratio was on the entire banking system. It's 1.64 percent. That means for every $100 deposited, they can create $1,634. Sir Josiah Stamp, who is a former president of the Bank of England, said, Fractional reserve banking as we know it today was conceived in iniquity and born in sin. Bankers rule the world. Take the world away from them, but leave them the power to create money, and they will buy the world back again. The central banks are now today printing money, creating debt, ledger book debt and credit, with a flick of a pen. The licensing of banks by government to create unlimited credit has led to vast amounts of money supply worldwide, which is no more than interest-bearing ledger book entries. In Australia, in excess of 94% of the estimated $400 billion money supply has entered circulation through people borrowing credit and becoming debtors to banks. In Australia, in the United States, in the uh, 1890s, in the early 1900s, until the Depression, in fact, the question of this monetary question was very, very active in politics. Nowadays, they like to say, oh, well, that's a question we have to leave to the experts. Central banks have played a major role in replacing the gold standard and the issuing and maintaining of today's debt or fiat money. The Federal Reserve System is a, is a wonderful institution and it's there to protect the common man and to provide stability in banking. And well, who are the experts? The Federal Reserve. When you really go into the history of it, you find out that the Federal Reserve System is a cartel. I mean, if you had a hen house, would you say, we need to leave the problem about what to do with the chickens at night to these foxes over here? They know all about it. The Federal Reserve is a corporation. It is not a government institution. Now, it works hand in hand with the Treasury. Big leap forward to turning over uh, the strings of power on when it comes to currency was in 1913 when we created the Federal Reserve. The 20th century has seen the establishment of central banks in every developed nation of the world. In most Western nations, at the time of their inception, they were considered illegal by many constitutional lawyers. The Commonwealth Bank of Australia was established in 1910 and later renamed the Reserve Bank of Australia. It was, like every other central bank, established to control the issue and preserve the value of currency and maintain stability in the banking sector. They decided to go into partnership with the federal government, enact this into law, sell it to the American people and to Congress as a great means of helping the common man people in the country, the Congress in this country, have neglected their uh, responsibilities and have allowed this to emerge. The power to create money has been granted to this private entity. We created the Federal Reserve and they systematically undermined the monetary system to the point where they eliminated the gold standard where they could monetize our debt at, at, at uh, will. It creates debt in order to enrich itself. The amount of power that the monopoly on money creation gives to the central banking system and to the commercial banking system. I'm on the bank committee. I'm not even allowed to know how the Federal Reserve works. I can't attend their meetings. It's to totally secretive. All of the most powerful political and financial interests imaginable are lined up behind this central banking system. It's the same system you've got. It's the same system all over the world. Since 1971, when the last remnant of the gold standard was removed, we have had, we've seen an explosion of our debt. And the Fed is always there to be the lender of last resort. I mean, this is a system that has to be carefully controlled or it'll blow up in a minute because there's no base to it and there's this huge capacity to increase the money supply. Governments growing bigger and unable to live within their means and businesses and corporations concerned with quicker and easier profits for shareholders all combine to put pressure on money supply. The money supply of a wealth-based economy can only expand as the economy becomes more productive and creates more wealth, forcing the government and business to slower, controlled growth. Throughout history, the temptation to abandon a wealth standard like gold and expand the money supply at will has always been met with willingness by the profit-hungry money changers and banks. In the short term, prosperity abounds for all, 
but historically, the long-term consequences of biased weights and measures and debased currencies has been catastrophic. In the decade from 1981 to 1991, the world's gross product grew fourfold. However, conservative totals for that same period estimate the world's debt grew 23 times, with Australia's proportional growth in debt 24 times. The system must constantly be, be creating more money. A debt money system is continually bankrupt. All new money is loaned into circulation as interest-bearing debt. To create money out of nothing and then loan it out and charge interest on top of that. While this creates the principal, it never creates the interest. And this is the fatal flaw. You have to keep creating enough money to pay the interest on the debt. As this debt goes up, the money supply still stays small. When everybody wants their money back, the money is not going to be there to pay it back. There's an inherent tendency in the system to bankrupt borrowers. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first inflation, then by deflation, the banks will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. We give a private corporation the right to take from other people real things of value that they've worked for, their land, the product of their life, their work, their labor, for nothing. They create this, these bank deposits out of nothing. These African countries cannot pay back the banks. They told them in exchange for the debt is we are going to take control of your natural resources and your ability to produce wealth. This is a process of the bankers further enriching themselves. Doesn't matter how bad their system gets, they are not going to give up that power. Stalin said ruling classes never voluntarily leave the stage of history. Those people are not going to give up that monopoly on money creation. As long as men have that power, to create money out of nothing, eventually the monetary system will be destroyed. History teaches that very clearly. Confidence is a significant factor. The fractional reserve system is a confidence game. Notes of today are not backed by anything of value and rely on confidence only. Without confidence, many believe a paper money system will collapse. Present experience indicates the system can operate without a gold guarantee. The only confidence required is a firm conviction that money will be accepted for goods and services. Still many maintain that confidence is easily disturbed, not able to offer the stability of a system backed by wealth. What then makes Federal Reserve notes acceptable in payment of debts? Maybe it is the confidence that they will be able to exchange such forms of money for real goods and services. Confidence in these forms of money also seems to be tied in a way to the assets that exist on the books of government and banks, even though most of these assets themselves are no more than pieces of paper, such as promissory notes. Well, the whole system just runs on confidence. There are many ways in which the confidence could be shaken, and people get scared uh, then the entire system will implode on itself very rapidly. Some are swept by alarm, and bank after bank across the country is hit by panic withdrawals. New lines appear on American streets, depositors swarming to snatch out what savings they have left before it's too late. Banks by the hundreds, by the thousands, are forced to close. A run on the bank is, is the big, uh, it, it's the big fear that people have, both banks and depositors. That would precipitate runs on other banks. They're giving us notes, and the notes aren't redeemable for anything whatsoever, and they don't even keep very many of the notes in the bank itself. Technically, the bank cannot honor its commitment to all of its depositors. They always keep on hand just a small percentage, usually about 3 to 5 percent of their total obligations, counting on the fact that usually most depositors, not more than 3 to 5 percent, will ever want their money back at one time. If just this 3 to 5 percent went to withdraw their deposits at the same time, it would trigger a run on the banking system within hours, leading to a collapse of the entire system worldwide. When people saw those crowds of people on television outside of banks, they would go down to their bank. And all of a sudden the fraud is exposed and they have to close their doors and say, I'm sorry, this is a bank holiday. We cannot do business today. Over the years, depositors have been told 
that deposit insurance, like the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in the U.S., will protect depositors' funds from future runs and banking collapses. The impression is that the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation makes their deposits safe. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation is only funded for a small fraction of the kind of commitments they would have to endure. So it would collapse almost immediately. If more than two or three percent of the entire banking portfolio were to go into default, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation absolutely could not cover it. You have to keep creating enough money to pay the interest on the debt. So it's a system that has to keep growing like that, and it has an inherent tendency to go hyperbolic, that is, to, to, to reduce the value of the monetary unit to zero. This devaluing of the monetary unit is called inflation. The noble fight against it is the topic of so many news reports, election campaigns, and vain political and economic debate. But truth is rarely told. Inflation is the inescapable reality of a debt-based economy. Inflation means one and only one thing, an increase in the money supply. You keep diluting the economy. The value of those monetary units is, gets weaker and weaker and weaker. It doesn't maintain that medium of exchange that it once did. You have to keep expanding the money supply or the whole thing goes deflationary. As they do that, the money becomes worth less and less and less. Prices do not go up. It's just that the value of the purchasing unit, in our case the dollar, goes down. It's not a rise in prices. That's a different thing. That's the result. The impact of inflation on an economy is far-reaching and destructive. But probably the greatest damage is what it does to the productive base of the economy, the middle class. Well over 60 years, we have had this inflationary system. Inflationary process, not only does it distort the value of the money, but it distorts the economy. It fools the, the participants in the economy into thinking certain investments will be profitable when in fact they won't be. Eventually, you have more and more of that malinvestment in, built into the economy. Everyone is more and more vulnerable to any kind of downturn. You've had 60 years, over 60 years, to build in all of, of that malinvestment. Ultimately, they're forced into the situation where they don't have any choice. They have to print money in order to pay their bills. Turning up the printing presses is the inevitable result of desperate government reacting to the pressures of shrinking tax bases high budget deficits, and the costs of servicing old debt. This rapid expansion of money supply catapults economies into hyperinflation. This century alone, do you know how many major inflations have destroyed the middle class? Where the German currency after World War I, the Weimar Republic, is gone because they inflated it out of existence. In 1919, a retiree could live very comfortably off 50,000 marks. So you go in a very brief four-year span where it, all it took was 160 marks to buy an ounce of gold. In October of 1923, it, it uh, took 87 trillion mark notes to purchase an ounce of gold. By 1921, the banks would close any accounts that only had 50,000 marks in it. It would cost them 250,000 marks just for the postage stamp to mail it to you. This 100 billion mark note was not worth the paper it was printed on, and people literally were using this to heat their homes and to cook their food. Remember, in 1919, 50,000 mark was a lot of cash. You need to protect yourself against inflation more than anything else. We have not solved the inflation problem. It's in a low stage right now, but when it sparks back up, it'll spark really large. Debt that must be serviced with money that doesn't exist. Total lack of any reserves and currencies that are absolutely worthless. These factors contribute to make every aspect of this system unsustainable. What you have to understand about a, a fractional reserve, debt money, central bank system, is that it's inherently fragile. Here are these huge megalithic banks that get all this money. How could they have a financial problem? Because as soon as the confidence factor in the economy is shaken, people will run down to the bank and they would say, give me all my money back. This is a system that has to be carefully controlled or it'll blow up in a minute because there's no base to it and there's this huge capacity to increase the money supply. It winds up being a disaster. When I say a disaster, I mean a complete and total disaster. The, you're, you're talking about wiping out the wealth of the middle class. The fear is that 
the people that are holding it together with band-aids will run out of band-aids. The problems associated with our present monetary system are so profound. At times when considering the implications, people within the central and commercial banking system have themselves expressed reservations and even alarm. In 1939, just a few short years after the Great Depression, Robert Hempel was the credit manager of the Federal Reserve Bank in Atlanta. If all the loans were paid back, there would not be a dollar of coin or currency left in circulation. This is a staggering thought. Someone has borrowed every dollar in circulation, cash or credit. If banks create ample synthetic money, we are prosperous. If not, we starve. We are absolutely without a permanent money system. The complete tragic absurdity of our hopeless position is almost incredible. So important is it that our present civilization may indeed collapse unless it becomes widely understood and the defects remedied. Sixty years have passed since this observation. While the subject of many books and speculation, the collapse of our system, for now at least, has been postponed. Every civilization that has tampered with its currency and enslaved its people to debt and left the error unrepaired has paid the ultimate price. One way or the other, I believe the lessons will be relearned. And at some future time, we will see an economy based on gold or silver. America's experience with the devastating effects of hyperinflation in the latter half of the 1700s greatly influenced the writing of the Constitution and the passing of the Coinage Act. The continental currency, much like our own notes uh, today, was not backed by anything. It wasn't redeemable for anything. For the 60 years preceding that, America had been plagued. All of the colonies had been plagued by problems with paper money. For a very uh, quick succession of events, the value of the continental note became basically worthless, and they died in the hands of the bearers. Coining money and printing money are not the same thing, and these men in 1789 certainly knew the difference. As a direct result of the loss of, of personal fortunes, uh, the Founding Fathers specified that uh, the lawful money of account in the United States shall be gold and silver. saw this as a favorable opportunity to shut and bar the door to, to paper money, to crush it forever. The Founding Fathers who wrote the clause into our Constitution forbidding the use of paper money without being backed by precious metals. In Australia, you have the very same legal situation we have here. You have a common law right and a statutory right and a constitutional right to a sound gold and silver currency. In 1792, Congress also passed what was called the Coinage Act. The value or the denomination of our currency will be the dollar. Uh, the dollar is specified as 371 and a quarter grains of fine silver. And then against the silver, uh, gold was valued at a 15 and a half to 1 ratio. I believe in a 100% uh, gold coin standard. They're the only money that has worked. While at times the topic of heated debate, the return to a wealth-based system is often seen as the only solution to the chronic problems plaguing our economies today. While still retaining all the benefits and conveniences of fast, flexible electronic banking, to which we've grown accustomed. People fear this. They say, oh, that means you have to carry coins around. Of course not. Gold-backed dollars doesn't stop deficit spending, but it significantly restrains it. Between 1876 and 1879, they had a three-year period where they gradually withdrew the greenbacks, which were fiat currencies. They balanced the budget. They quit printing new greenbacks. And they said, we're going to live within our means. If you look at history, in every case, you'll see the same thing, that as long as the integrity of the money is maintained, a civilization is strong and sound. From 1789 to 1968 in America, 25 percent of the value of our currency had to be backed by gold. And the inflation genie was let out of the bottle in 1968 when Congress severed the link between the dollar and gold. The era of $100 billion, $200 billion, $300 billion deficit started. I don't think we're going to get it stopped until we recognize that error that was committed in 1968 and 71 and once again back the currency in America with gold. Will a transfer from our present debt-based system to one backed by wealth happen in a controlled, calculated way? Or will it emerge out of the ashes of the social and financial upheaval that our current system reserves for us? Sadly, 
the pattern of the past seemed to show that governments and people don't take the necessary steps until it is too late. The answer remains to be seen. That kind of a, of a system, we can move to a, a level of prosperity that we have never seen before. Gold has always stood the test of time. Since the earliest days of recorded civilization, the pervasiveness of gold has been undeniable. Transcending all cultures, it has been used in art, jewelry, as a medium of exchange in temples and religious worship, and as a hedge in times of political or economic chaos. Gold has always held a special place in the heart of man, being one of his highly prized and most sought after possessions. Its intrinsic value remains. The value of gold in particular has never changed throughout uh, time and millennium. There's a professor named Roy Jastrom. He took the records from the British Exchequer uh, back to the beginning of the reign of Henry VII, which is 1475. And he compared the, the, a basket of commodities, the cost of a basket of commodities, to uh, gold. Over time, it tended to return to a stable relation to that basket of commodities. In ancient Rome, a gold coin, a one-ounce gold coin, would buy a fine toga, a handcrafted belt, and a pair of sandals. Today, if you have a one-ounce gold coin, you can go into any men's store and buy a nice suit, a handcrafted belt, and a good pair of shoes. It'll buy you, uh, say, 400 loaves of bread. That's what it bought you 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Has gold gone up? The paper Federal Reserve notes have gone down. In our country and in your country and in all the countries of the world, prices keep going up and up and up because the value of those monetary units keeps going down, down, and down. The price for these items in terms of real money hasn't changed in thousands and thousands of years. Of an investment mania that's been going on and building up over, uh, over the last 15 years. People living in the late 1990s have witnessed one of the great stock and equity booms of all time. A.J. Frost and I wrote a book in 1978 that talked about the coming great bull market. We said we're going to have a terrific bull market and it's going to create a top that's bigger than 1929, bigger than 1835, and its closest cousin is the great top in Europe in 1720. Prices are going to rise. Paper has been driven up in price. Right now, that's what's happening in our stock market. All of that new money has gone into financial assets, and that's the reason why you've seen this enormous boom. That does not reflect the true value of that stock market. It actually goes beyond a speculative orgy. The, the term I've used is um, aggressive complacency. It makes the market much more dangerous. I think it makes it inherently, uh, potentially, a lot more volatile. Except for a few market corrections, minor in comparison, the great bull markets of recent years have seen markets steadily expand since the Great Depression. There is no example, including the 1929 high and the 1835 high, uh, of any time when stocks were more expensive than they are today. And that tells us that uh, there's more risk than there ever has been before. There's a correction coming in the U.S. stock market of major dimensions. The ultimate result of extreme overvaluation is ultimately a severe correction. Price to earnings ratio in the U.S. stock market today cries for correction. The Dow Jones Industrial Average now yields 1.9 percent. You have to pay your broker that much to buy and sell the stocks. Because of the fragility of the system, I think you have the possibility of the stock market collapsing. When it stops, the value of paper is going to drop like a rock. In terms of the equity and the bond mutual funds, I think it's certainly time to diversify out of those. Because the long term, I think, is five to ten years of extreme difficulty in the markets. But conditions are fundamentally sound. Now here's a tip. Some of these prices will look ridiculously low in a year or two. As the world entered 1929, stock markets were posting record highs. Americans flooded to the markets in record numbers tempted by the prospect of a fast buck. Inexperienced first-time investors were told this is a new era of profit-taking and the returns vastly outweigh the risks. Just days before the biggest crash in history, 
analysts and brokers gave markets a clean bill of health. In search of easier and bigger profits, many borrowed heavily to participate in the wild markets of the day. Up through early October of 1929, the Wall Street Magazine was giving glowing predictions about the economy is doing well and the, the stock market and the bond market. The market was artif driven artificially high, very similar to what's happening right now, where there was leveraged buying in the investment world. People only invest in that which goes up. Everyone is doing it. And everybody is getting rich. Why not? Everything is going one way, and one way only. Up, 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 and up. Americans have become fearless speculators, living in a make-believe world, getting rich quick without working. Today is, is much wilder in terms of the breadth of speculation. We're actually borrowing money to buy stocks, bonds, mutual funds. We're all convinced, why should I put my money in the bank for uh, few percent interest when I can get a guaranteed 20 percent in the stock market every single year. There is a larger percentage of the population involved in stocks today than there were in the 1920s. You got far more people participating now. It's nearly impossible for the typical investor to rise above the influence of the crowd. Forty-three percent of the American people were in the stock market. We're not talking about institutions, we're talking about, you know, individual investors. First of all, the typical investor is not a market professional who knows history and knows the way markets operate. By a seasoned investor, what I mean is somebody who has lived through all of the delusions of a bull market and gone all the way to the bottom. It was panic. Sixteen and a half million shares of stock sold in a single day. You can read about it, but until you experience it, until you see your own self-delusion, you know, the way after the market's topped and the technical evidence is all there, you still keep holding on, you keep, still keep saying, no, I think it's going to come back, it's going to come back. And the reason is because you began with this set of, of ideas in your mind, and you can't change those. The whole growth of gambling in the financial markets called derivatives. I wouldn't even call them investments, I'd call them speculations. It gives the false assumption that there is a pent-up demand for these particular investments, which drives the prices higher. The quest for greater profits leads to the use of greater leverage. Investment bankers, brokers, and large fund managers these days use derivatives. The most extreme form of leveraged speculation these financial instruments allow a relatively small amount of money to control a very large profit or loss. When the market gets volatile and dramatic is when derivatives become extremely dangerous. The Bundesbank has actually said that if one of the big players in the derivative market ever decides to bail out of it, it could cause a worldwide collapse. It threatens to undermine the stability of the whole economic system of our world. Deflation is an implosion in the money supply, and because so much of it is, is debt, uh, all it takes is a reduction in the valuation of that debt to, to cause the decrease in the money supply. A bond is a certificate of debt issued to raise money with the promise to pay back with interest. Most of government's money today is debt issued through bonds. These bonds are considered a most creditworthy investment, as they are backed by the full faith and credit of the government. But the question remains, what happens when a weary bond market runs out of confidence, realizing that government is hopelessly broke and completely unable to meet its obligations? You have to keep expanding the money supply or the whole thing goes deflationary, and when it does, oh my, you've got a problem. Deflation is a thing that destroys even more than inflation. Because all of that is uh, money of the mind. In a sense, it doesn't exist. And when people turn bearish and begin to devalue that money, in other words, those bonds, notes, and bills, the money disappears. It's going to devastate people because what they had of value loses its value, and therefore they're able to do less with it. When that deflation starts, there's just no way to stop it. Over $14 billion go with them, and so goes the confidence of a nation. The sun rises just as it has done every day for many thousands of years. Men and women go about their lives and businesses as usual, working to provide for themselves and their loved ones. Only the events of this day will set it apart from any other. For this day, 
quite beyond anyone's control, a chain of events will be set into motion that will change everyone's lives more dramatically than anyone could ever imagine. For on this day, just 15% of people, stirred by talk of increased interest rates or more bad news, decide not to buy, but to sell their shares. Or maybe 5% of businesses decide this day to call on their cash reserves from the bank. Or just 10 or 15%, alarmed by the ever-increasing size of government debt, ring their brokers and sell their bonds. In the last two hours, we have examined some of the fundamentals that threaten the economy of our world, and indeed, our very existence. Whether the fractional reserve banking system, government securities or bonds, or just the hope that the stock market will continue to rise forever, or maybe the realization that we are completely devoid of real money, all of these fundamentals are maintained entirely by confidence. But confidence is easily shaken. Speculation abounds as to what will trigger a loss of confidence. But in reality, on the day that people awake to realize that every aspect of our financial and economic system is frail, the resulting crash in confidence will domino affect every market and every aspect of our fragile system. Yet this crash is to come at a time when our interdependence and reliance on the system for our day-to-day -day survival has never been greater. Coming low, it's going to be so major that uh, it's going to have social implications that are just as major. You know, just endemic, chronic, insoluble depression. The crunch that's going to come when the government will have no more money left in this country to be able to look after the people. The kind of turmoil that's forthcoming um, uh, could be far more substantial than even the turmoil of the early 30s. Recent decades have seen tensions building in society. Given the dramatic downturn in the economy that sustains them, will these tensions explode to the surface? One in 10 US citizens is foreign born. One isn't an American today. He's a black, he's a white, he's a man, he's a woman, he's a rich, he's a poor. If there's not an economy that offers jobs and opportunities for everyone, we could have a really, really, really serious social meltdown here. Economic good times that has held together the uh, seething veneer of, of racial unrest and class warfare envy that exists in the society. You didn't have five generations of people on welfare then who'd been taught to expect somebody to hand out a handout to them. Long period of uh, joblessness, of stagnation. Jobs are likely to go the way of the wind, particularly if they're working for larger corporations. It's fascinating to realize how quickly the food stores are emptied. Understand that our food chain in this country is at the most two or three days. What happens to a region after those two or three days? Generally is pandemonium and anarchy. We are less positioned today to, dis to sustain a disruption of food, water, power, or uh, police protection, what have you, than ever before. And so we've got to send home the firemen and the police. And these are two of the most crucial uh, public servants in terms of maintaining law and order. And there's a riot, whether it's an uh, unpopular jury verdict or whatever, to see how quickly there are outbursts of looting and rioting and so forth. They need to plan on losing their homes if they have a mortgage on them, lose the cars, anything that they have debt on. People are going to get angry when they can't look after their families. It happened in the last Great Depression. When they look at those IRAs, and the value's gone down to half or a third of what they had, they're going to be mad and they're going to come out with blood in their eyes looking for a scapegoat. It will not only wipe out the middle class, but it will also wipe out many, uh, if not most, uh, wealthy people. The trauma, the turmoil, the civil unrest, the crime is really terrifying. The one question that really remains is how can we protect ourselves, our loved ones, and our capital and estate from what many now see as an inevitable formality? In history, those who've seen the inevitable storm coming and prepared for it have been able to survive and in most cases profit greatly from it. The last two generations have seen society undergo dramatic change 
While now surrounded by constant rises in the cost of living, unemployment, family breakdowns, increase in crime and general moral breakdown, many espouse a rediscovery of the ideals, values and work ethic of the past. Today's society is a society which is uh, committed to immediate gratification. It's a society that has grown up to live on debt, in contrast to the culture that gave birth to this country, a culture which was uh, one of uh, individual achievement, individual responsibility, a commitment to ideals. Life is a reward for hard work and commitment and creativity, and not something that one is entitled to because there's a mechanism to steal it from others. Today, many areas of hidden costs prevent people being able to get ahead and remain there. Anyone today can get sued. There's a lawsuit filed every 15 seconds. These litigating attorneys are inventing over 70 new causes of action each and every year. The cost of litigation is very, very high. The outcome of a lawsuit has little to do with the merits of the case. There's a litigation explosion started 15, 20 years ago. In 1993, the American Bar Association estimated that there was a 37 percent probability of um, an individual being entangled in some form of legal action in any given year. We are seeing a rash of lawsuits for the most frivolous things you can think of. People who uh, have uh, uh, assets that are vulnerable and exposed uh, will probably lose them at some point in their life. What's complicating that is the tax burden on those people is larger than they realize. Their ability to rise above that is th thus more uh, trampled than they first expect. Because taxation is such a horrendous part of our life, taxation has to be figured into the bottom line. A preparation strategy to achieve and maintain financial and personal independence today is of paramount importance. Lower your cost of living, get out of debt, and then have a strategy to guard your liquidity. The biggest risk that someone has right now is debt. Downsize what you owe. Right now, today, find a way to live on a lower cost level. Lowering the cost of living and paying off old debt while not taking on further debt is a vital preparation tool. Cut up your credit card and say, no more credit, period. You're going to live on what you make. Are there things you're maintaining, a boat in the garage or whatever? Are there things you can rent when you need it rather than actually own? Pay off your car. Make a vow. Don't buy another car unless you can pay cash. If you can pay a car off on time with interest, you can save up the money to buy the car. It's just a matter of doing without a new car for a while. Your liquidity is uh, going to be crucial in the coming times. Protecting one's hard-earned assets from any form of attachment requires careful forward planning. It becomes beneficial to do some form of asset protection. The trust is a very significant asset building tool. Working towards self-sufficiency and self-employment by providing an essential service or something that everyone needs is an important part of preparation strategy. Large corporations are one of the riskiest places to be now in America's history because they're extremely vulnerable uh, to economic downturns. People have to be able to take care of themselves. There will always be needs for people to do things, more so than ever if there is a collapse. The average investor is going to have uh is going to learn something. Unfortunately, it's going to be uh, at a high price. People applying preparation strategy are liquidating assets, particularly paper assets and the stock market. We encourage people to be getting out of the stock market now and getting into something, a tangible asset, or to have a minimum of 20% of your net assets in cash that you can put your hands on. Those people who have put 100% of their asset portfolio and investments um, into paper. It's an exceedingly risky proposition. Invest for the long term. Well, I think I'm investing for the long term by being short, because the long term, I think, is five to ten years of extreme difficulty in the market. We have a saying around here, be in cash before the crash. Buy stocks and forget about them. You can't do that. Every major bear market in, in history has caused a lot of companies to go under, bankrupt. The stocks go to zero. Positioning for that is crucial for the survival of value. It's going to be very difficult for the average investor to find a haven. The pres preservation of wealth is a major, major concern. It's so important for people to get out now, maintain whatever profits and purchasing power they have, so that when the real bottom comes, they will be able to take advantage of that. The few times in history when a major bottom has occurred, those were the times when if you put in 
a large portion of your speculative funds, uh, you could have essentially set your family and your loved ones for life. With the dangers facing the investment markets in the days ahead, it is probably more difficult now than at any other time for investors to receive a safe return. Some view the resource sector as offering good returns while providing a greater degree of safety. Projects uh, that appear to have great size potential, uh, big discoveries uh, result in big markets. Now the gold mining venture is something that can achieve not only outstanding long-term gains, but it will also achieve in many cases uh, very good near-term gains as well. If you can identify something that has size potential and drilling confirms that size potential, that's the best kind of stock to own because it's going to go and go and go. A little bit of gold and silver is always very, very good to protect against the ultimate collapse. The ultimate liquidity is gold, which is the only asset, the only financial asset that is not simultaneously somebody else's debt. Man's high regard for gold and silver has always caused him to return to it in times of political and economic upheaval. Holding some gold and silver is again today the number one preparation strategy. Gold is the only real money. Everything else is just a promise to pay it. So if you want real money, you should have it, have it in gold and silver, in precious metal. If you own gold or silver, that you will have a hedge against, against that problem because they're the ultimate liquidity. Gold has been, for 5,000 years, our standard for value. Number one, because you can't print it. Many people hold gold as a, me a currency or a medium of exchange under times of severe civil unrest and crises. That you don't get out of a country that's collapsing, as we saw in Vietnam, not with paper money. You get out with pieces of gold. This vast undervaluation, when that pendulum swings back the other way, it'll go way out the other way. The eventual price of gold is not going to be $400 an ounce or $500 an ounce. It's not going to be $1,000 an ounce. It's going to be $20,000 an ounce or $25,000 an ounce or $45,000 an ounce before it stops. Whenever there's been a crash, gold and silver have always gained in value. You will be able to acquire anything that you want to if you have a supply of gold on hand. This is what happened in 1979, 78, 79. People were trying to find some way to protect themselves. They ran into gold, they ran into silver, and what most people don't understand is that's a real small door. When things start to crash, if inflation takes off, then people are have enough recent experience with gold and silver reacting positively to higher inflation rates. So there will be an immediate run toward these metals. Commodity markets today trade a trillion dollars a day. Their hedge funds are worth many, many billions of dollars. So it's a minuscule amount of silver. And gold, of course, is, you know, the same thing's true for gold. And when everybody tries to rush in there at once, the price has to just skyrocket to clear the market. Penny, 16 and a half million shares of stock sold in a single over 6,000 years of recorded human history have painted a grim but provocative picture. The civilizations that have risen and fallen tell an age-old story that when the time-proven principles of sound money and economics are abandoned in favor of valueless currency, uncontrolled spending and crippling debt, without exception, the civilization and its unsuspecting people always pay the full price. But from the ashes and ruins emerges a new era ruled by those that were prepared. A golden era. A new millennium. The choice is yours. See, and this, the moral connection is the thing that's fooled me over the years because we know that God is a just God. It says in Zephaniah, I will, he will do justice every day, every morning. And I look at this system and I, I think to myself, man, this has gone on longer than ever before in history. America had its greatness because of its commitment to a set of values. Its founding fathers had a commitment to, to the Bible and to biblical principles. And America's greatness emerged from those principles and from a commitments. And over the century, the last two centuries, that those, uh, it has departed from those principles. No free government can stand without virtue in the people. And when you have a country where people are looking out mostly for themselves, 
and they're not thinking about the consequences of their actions, they're asking for something and not giving enough back, you will then end up with not just the fiscal deficit, but a moral deficit. Because you can't, a free governing people cannot hope to govern themselves without fixed standards and moral absolutes. In fact, the subject that brings us here today. See, the promise that's held out is a promise of idolatry. It's a people who worship prosperity. They're worshiping at the temple of Mammon, and, and the priests of Mammon come to them and they say, let us have the power, worship our God, forget the laws of your God, and we will make you rich. Well, they made us rich, all right, except they forgot about 1933. Robert Bork has written an outstanding book called Slouching to Gomorrah. And he points out in the final chapters of his book, the only hope for America is a grassroots spiritual revival. That's a moral issue as much as it is a fiscal issue. Because our monetary systems around the world have violated a biblical principle and they have built the whole system upon a dishonest weights and measures. I, I think God blesses a nation that shows integrity and even-handedness, equity in its laws. And if, you know, I mean, if you want to talk about it from a moral standpoint, from a biblical standpoint, there's no question that inflation is, it's an abomination. You know, false weights and measures are an abomination to the Lord. What is inflation but false weights and measures? That's what it is. And I have to say that if you look at history, that, that the decline of a nation morally most often seems to begin with this monetary sin. And I don't know what else you can call it because it is a sin. I believe that we serve God because he is God, not because God can do something for us. I, I, I believe our primary protector is the Lord, not money, not gold, not any assets at all. In a world of rapid...